Great, thank you very much. And uh, the first time the organizers for inviting me. And um, let me also say that this is the first time I'm attending a workshop which has the word stochastic in it. <laughs> so there are many new faces, um, but I'm very happy to be here. And let, so now to disappoint you a bit, there is no stochastics in my talk. Okay? But maybe there are some, some, some interesting connections, let's see. So this talk is about uh, the long time behavior of the uh, 2D Euler equations on the sweep. Um, and this is recent work and it's work in progress. So there's a lot to do. But uh, I, I wanted to tell you about this because I hope to get some, some feedback on what we're doing. Um, I should also say that <coughs> this work is, is, was initiated with a, a PhD project for Milo Viviani. Um, so he's a PhD student with me and he's uh, soon finishing his, uh, his thesis work. So, okay, let's start. Um, and do I have some pointers? Yeah, but this plug into the room. No, but the pointer works. Yeah, All right, I can use this. No, no, no. no. Yeah, no it's just the pointer you want. Yes, good. Yeah. It's the middle one. Yeah. It's the middle one. So, so let's start with the Euler equations. Uh, so ideal hydrodynamics, incompressible fluid, uh, no viscous forces. Um, so this is how they look like. V is a vector beam on the domain, um, and P is the pressure. I tend to think of, of this as just a Lagrangian multiplier to ensure that we uh, that the V is a divergence free vector field, so that the fluid is these equations were formulated already by uh, Leonard Euler, as you know, a uh, long time ago. Um, but the point I want to make here is that these equations actually make sense on any Riemannian manifold. Because if you have a Riemannian structure, you know what uh, the covariant derivative is, so you know what this term is, you know, also know what the gradient is, you know what this is, and you have a divergent response. And this is already set. Okay, and the, the basic question is, um, what is the generic, let's say, long time behavior for these equations? So physicists have been thinking about this for, for a long, long time. And of course, we know in, in 3D, there's not much we can do. We don't even know how uh, existent, uh, long time existence in, in the strong sense. So, so let's consider instead the, the two dimensional problem. And then more is known, because uh, there is a process known as the inverse energy cascade, which was sort of formulated by a physicist, Kreishan, in, in the 60s. Uh, and this sort of gives us uh, some uh, idea of what, what happens in, in the long uh, time uh, range for these equations. Also, as you know, we already have mathematically long time existence of our equations in, in, in smooth enough settings. So based on this inverse energy cascade, physicists have formulated various uh, hypotheses, <coughs> typically based on <coughs> mechanics, on uh, what will happen. So let me uh, present some of them. So I'm going to focus on the 2 d case. And, and just one slide to say that, I mean, why, why, are, why are physicists interested in this? Uh, well, to understand this inverse energy cascade is, is uh, perhaps uh, one of the holy grails of, of 2D incompressible uh, hydrodynamics. And uh, you want, what they want to understand are things like the formations you see, for example, with Jupiter, where you have the, 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 the great red spot, um, and, and other formations on other planets and our, our atmosphere as well. So that's why 2D Euler equations uh, on spheres are, are actually uh, very physically relevant. So the first thing we do is we, we take our Euler equations, it's now on a, let's say, two-dimensional manifold, uh, and we apply the curve to this to get the uh, vorticity formulation. We've seen that already in several talks uh, today. And then the equations look like this, where omega is our vorticity and psi is the stream function, and the relation between them is by the Poisson equation. And of course, you recover 
uh, the vector field by taking the, the, the skew gradient of this link function. So if you look at this equation, what I had there was the Poisson bracket, but you can also write it in terms of uh, lead derivatives. Uh, and if you write it like this, it's clear that this is a transport equation, right? So the vorticity is transported along the, the flow of our vector field. Uh, so this implies many things. There is a deep uh, Hamiltonian structure behind this. It's called a Lee Poisson structure. I will call, talk more about that later. But you meet it, you get that uh, you have infinitely many conservation laws. And, and there are two types of conservation laws, let's say. Uh, it's the ones that are sort of intrinsic to this type of uh, Hamiltonian dynamics. Those conservation laws are called Casimir functions. And there are infinitely many. In fact, you take any sort of smooth enough fun function W from on, on, the, on the real line, and you apply it to all, again, you integrate over the domain, and that gives you a uh, Uh, but then you also have other uh, conservation laws which are specific to the, the, the Hamiltonian that you're working with. Those could be like conservation of energy, always have that as well. That depends on the Hamiltonian, of course, that is in fact the Hamiltonian. And uh, you have, uh, you can have other symmetries in your system leading to conservation of momentum and so on. So there are different types of conservation <coughs> laws. Uh, I should also say that by just looking at this equation and realizing that this is a transport equation, so omega is just transported by the velocity field. You, you sort of, it's natural to make this ansatz that we, we look for weak solutions that are just the sum of, of, of delta pulses, right? These are called point vortex solutions. They're, they're sort of formal solutions or weak solutions to, to, to these equations. And what happens is that you, you, you think of vorticity as being a sum of delta pulses and these delta pulses are just moved around by the vector field. So this gives you finite dimensional dynamics as sort of uh, an invariant set of weak solutions to these point vortex dynamics, uh, to these, uh, oil, these oil equations. Uh, and that will be important later on in, in our talk. Um, so that's why I, I wanted to, to point it out here. Okay, so let's say something about statistical mechanics theories for the 2D Euler. And the idea goes back to Unsager. It's uh, in, in the 1940s, Lars Unsager. Um, and his idea was really to use this point vortex uh, model and approximate the flow by taking many, many uh, point vortices. So taking a large number of them. Approximate the flow. This is a canonical Hamiltonian system finite dimensional, right? High dimension, but finite dimensional. So then you can think of this, you can think of typical things you do for Hamiltonian systems, like uh, is there inv an uh, invariant measure and, uh, and ergodicity and so on. And he basically thought, okay, so let's presume that the system is ergodic, and what can we then say about the long time behavior? That was his idea. Um, but to use these, uh, Point vortices is not always such a good idea when you're trying to look for a smooth solution because it's not really a smooth solution at all. Uh, so, so this theory was sort of generalized by looking instead at um, the continuous setting uh, done by Miller in 1990 and Robert and Sumer in 1991. So I will refer to this as the, as the MRS theory. Uh, and basically what they're doing is they, they minimize uh, microcanonical entropy under the uh, constraints that you preserve both energy and the Casimir functions. And they look for that uh, sort of equilibrium to the uh, equations. And this, oops, sorry, yeah, this, I wanted to say this predicts uh, an equilibrium of large scale vortex structures. Okay. So this is the theory that many, many physicists are sort of assuming to be true. Um, but is it, is it really correct? That's the, the, the question here. And of course, the mathematical answer is no. It's not correct. It's clear. Because everyone knows that the two d Euler equations are not ergodic. Right? So, but that didn't stop the physicists. 
uh, because the, the sort of what they did is say, okay, it's not true, of course, in general, but perhaps it's generically correct. So for most, in, most initial data, maybe this is the behavior in these equations. Okay. And this, is, this uh, guess is actually not completely without merit, because if you look in uh, finite dimensional Hamiltonian systems, this is typically what happens. So you take some finite dimensional Hamiltonian system, and what you see is that often the flow is sort of ergodic, uh, except at small sort of portions of the phase space. And these are called KM islands, and this, this is of course connected to KM theory, common law of Arnold Moser theory for dynamical systems. And the larger you make the phase space, the smaller uh, these islands are, the harder they are to find in, in general. So it's, so it's actually a good guess that, in fact, if we take this infinite dimensional system, it should, in general, even though we can find some of these islands, uh, the generic behavior should be that it's say, ergodic. Okay, so how do we test this uh, theory? Well, what people are doing is they're they are doing numerical simulations. It's very, very hard to make progress uh, theoretically, so let's... Um, make some, some numerical simulations to test the theory. But once you start doing that, you realize that uh, you really need, I mean, the theory is based on conservation of Casimir's, and it's based on the conservation of these underlying uh, symplectic structure, the lead Poisson structure. So, so really, in, or, in order to test this, it's essential that you, you preserve these structures. Otherwise, you cannot trust anything. Uh, so this means that you can, t the classical methods for, for these type of PDEs, like finite differences, finite elements, finite volumes, and so on, you can just throw them out the window because they don't preserve these quantities. So you need something else. Um, and, and to construct such a method, sort of, that preserves uh, all these structures, has been done on the torus, on the two torus. So this is called the sine bracket discretization um, of the Euler equations. It is based on a quantization theory uh, developed by James Hoppe in the, in the 80s or the early 90s. And Hoppe didn't think about the Euler equations at all. He was more interested in the problem of quantization, which is a, a, a problem in, in mathematical physics. Uh, but he developed explicit uh, quantization on, on, uh, on the torus. And then uh, Vladimir Zeitlin, um, he was very quick to, to realize that this quantization theory can be used to discretize uh, the oil equations. And the point is that the quantization theory completely uh, captures all the geometric structure uh, in the, uh, of the Lee Poisson system. So, so, he, so he developed, Zeitlin uh, developed this uh, sort of spatial discretization based on quantization. And, and then later on, Robert McLachlan also realized that you need to discretize in, in time as well in order to preserve the structure. And he came up with a, with a, a time discretization that preserves this uh, Lee Poisson structure. So this method is called the sine bracket method, and uh, it has been used to prove that the, or sort of to indicate that this MRS theory on the torus, on the two torus, seems to be correct. It, in, uh, it, it supports this theory, and this has been done by Abramov and Maeda and, and other authors as well. So that's nice, but the torus is not a sphere, right? And it's non-trivial <coughs> to, if you know how to quantize the, tor the torus, it doesn't mean that you can quantize other, other manifolds, it's a non-trivial task to go from one to the other, and many of the resulting quantization theories are abstract in the sense that they show, okay, give me a Keller manifold, let's say a compact Keller manifold, and then we know there exists a quantization, there are results of that type. But to explicitly construct it, which is what we need to do in numerics, is, is very, very hard. Um, but 
I think in the in the community, if you read papers, people sort of assumed that on the sphere this MRS theory should also be valid. It's, it's sort of confirmed on the on the torus, so probably it's also true on the sphere and other manifolds. But then there was a paper from 2015 by Dritschel, Key, and Marsh, Marston, where they did very high resolution classical numerical simulations. And the results seem to contradict this MRS theory. But then they use the classical methods, which are untrustworthy for MRS, because they don't preserve these uh, quantities. In fact, it's a lot of decay in the, in, in, in even just the first uh, Casimir de Anstrophy, there was a decay of 60% so, um, in their simulation. So, so of <laughs> course, I mean, you cannot trust that. So, so I think physicists, maybe they didn't pay too much attention to this because, yeah, it's a classical numerical method, so you cannot trust it. What they, what they got in their simulation was that uh, instead of getting some sort of steady state for the large scale motion, they got persistent unsteadiness. So this is sort of where we set off our mission. Uh, so that's the PhD work of Milo Viviani, was to try to construct a trustworthy discretization on S2 based on quantization. That's where we set off. Okay, so let me now um, say something about Lee Poisson structures. So the Euler equations on a sphere is an example of a Lee Poisson system. It's on an infinite dimensional uh, space. Of course, as you know, the space of vorticity functions. Uh, but let me first explain how this works uh, on a finite dimensional, in the finite dimensional settings. And this leads to so-called isospectral flows. So what we start with, we start with the Lie algebra G, um, and then we take some, let's say, smooth function uh, B that takes an element in the algebra and gives us another algebra. Remember, a Lie algebra we have a bracket. So it makes sense to, to look at this equation here. W is an element in the algebra. Think of it as a, as a matrix uh, 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 algebra. So, so, so W is really a, a square matrix, either complex or real. And then you look at this equation here mm, the, for, for various choices of this B. And this is a so-called isospectral flow. So this means that uh, the, eigenva the eigenvalues of V are preserved by this flow. This is sort of defining the property here. Uh, and uh, we also have, related to this, we also have Casimir functions. So if you take any analytic function F and you extend it to matrices and you take the trace of that, that's going to give you a conservation law for any choice of V. So you have this sort of infinitely many, but only finitely many independent first integrals. And the Hamiltonian case corresponds to the, to the case when, when B is uh, the gradient of some function, and the gradient is now taken with respect to um, some inner product that structure that is, uh, sort of um, fulfills certain requirements related to this uh, algebraic structure. Let's say it's a bivariate, if, if it's a compact uh, line. If it's, um, <laughs> okay, so that's the Poisson systems. The flow is isospectral, you preserve Casimir functions, and in the Hamiltonian case, you have a Hamiltonian function as well. So, what we want to do essentially is to take this infinite dimensional um, <coughs> Le Poisson system, namely the Euler equations on the two dimensional sphere, and we want to map it to some finite dimensional one. That's the, that's the idea of quantization. Now, well, no, the idea of quantization I will talk about later, but is to replace the, the Poisson bracket with, uh, with, su with such a uh, B bracket. So I said this is a Hamiltonian structure, but I want to point out that it's not a canonical Hamiltonian structure. So you don't have the normal Q and P variables. That's, that's maybe something to, to remember. And before we discuss uh, more about uh, the relation to the Euler equations, let me just say that these equations in themselves, for the finite dimensional case, 
have been studied a lot. So there are many, many systems uh, that uh, fall into to this uh, kind of system. So the, the total lattice is perhaps the most uh, famous one. These are comes from particles interacting pairwise with exponential forces, and uh, as you probably know, there are connections to the KDB equations and so on. There are also connections to numerical linear algebra. Uh, in some sense, the total lattice can be viewed as a flow that diagonalizes matrices and is therefore uh, connected to the, the QR algorithm, which is a, a well-known algorithm to compute uh, the uh, eigenvalues of a, of a matrix. You also have uh, the n-dimensional free rigid body. Here is the classical three-dimensional one. So the dynamics of, of, of that system is also an example of a nice spectral flow. Uh, there are infinite other infinite dimensional examples. Take the Heisenberg spin chain that describes the interaction between uh, spins. So a spin is a vector on the sphere, right? And you take uh, many of them, you put them uh, on a line, let's say like this, and you look at the interaction. Uh, that gives you uh, the so-called landau lipschitz equations. This is another example uh, of a uh, Eisenstein Eisen spectral flow. Okay, so back to Euler now. So we want to go from Euler to some isospectral flow via quantization. So first of all, um, what is the sort of Lee Poisson structure in, in the Euler case? Well, it looks like this. So the brackets that was before finite dimensional is now re replaced by the, the Poisson brackets. And then you have a Hamiltonian function, which in the case of, of the Euler equations looks like this. This is the string function, so it's related to omega by the, the Laplace operator. Um, and you differentiate the Hamiltonian, and that gives you the, the dynamics like this. And what the quantization is, it's really a way to move from, uh, to project this, the space of vorticities to some Lie algebra, finite dimensional Lie algebra, in such a way that the, you cannot expect the, the bracket to be exactly conserved, but so that it's nearly conserved, in some sense, as, as, we, as n gets larger and larger. This is sort of the basic problem of, of quantization. So these are Lie algebras, uh, so what we want to do is we want to take this system and replace it by some finite dimensional system like this, using the quantization. And in fact, um, there is a an explicit quantization construction also for the sphere, and it's also uh, constructed by Hopper. Uh, and later on, I think in like 2007 or something, um, the convergence. So. <coughs> so, so let me also say that this this mapping uh, is expressed through uh, spherical harmonics. So in the end, we have to work with spherical harmonics. So, so if you just like to think of this as a, some numerical method, it's let's say a numerical method where you initially at least represent your vorticity in terms of spherical harmonics okay, by expanding it at, at the spherical harmonics. Is it sort of projection? Yeah, that in projection is that? No, you can't do that. If you do that, you destroy all the structure. That's the, the point. Yeah. Okay, so so convergence of this uh, um, quantization was established uh, in ninety one. And what do we mean with convergence? This is uh, an operator, right? So certainly we cannot expect strong convergence. Because we're projecting onto a compact, uh, uh, I mean, uh, a compact linear uh, algebra. So, so uh, this is a weak type convergence, and that's the best you can expect in this case. And then we were very happy. Uh, this was uh, extremely uh, important for us because even though we had this explicit sort of quantization. Um, it looked like it was very complicated. So to do this numerically would be extremely expensive. Like the complexity would be something n to the power of four. Uh, 
operations, just to evaluate the right-hand side. Uh, and this is not feasible, then maybe we can do R and equal I mean, 10 or something, but we want to go up to R and equal uh, at least uh, 500 or something like that. But then it turns out that, that uh, these quantization people, they are also interested in the Laplacian, because the Laplacian is, of course, important in quantum mechanics. Uh, and there is a sort of discrete Laplacian, which, which you can compute by a very, very nice formula, which was derived <coughs> in a paper by, by Hoppe and Yao in 1998. And um, the point here is that these, these matrices Xn and the Xn plus and minus they are really sparse banded matrices. So this means that evaluation of this Laplacian here is very cheap. We can do it in just n square operations. Okay, nice. So now we have a candidate for our quantized equations. But remember, you need to compute this something sort of discrete analog of the stream function. That, that means you need to invert the Laplacian. We only have the Laplacian in the forward direction. But then there's <laughs> another sort of magic <coughs> ingredient, namely that uh, this Laplacian can be factorized into uh, what can be considered some lower triangular and upper triangular matrix, and therefore you can explicitly uh, compute its inverse in only n squared operations again. So, so this really helped us to come up with an algorithm which. Uh, which uses only n squared operations to, to evaluate uh, the, the stream function from the vorticity. But then, of course, you have to evaluate also the brackets, so that's matrix matrix multiplications. And these are now full matrices. I forgot to say that the, the algebra is given by SUN. So these are uh, complex matrices that are skew Hermitian and whose trace uh, is zero. So, so we have to evaluate these uh, matrix multiplications, and that's, of course, n cube, op cube operations. So the whole process just to evaluate this right-hand side now is n cube operations, which is worse than what you get with classical methods. With classical methods, you would get, so the number of degrees of freedom is n squared. So with classical methods, you will be get the best method to give you n squared operations. So it, it's worse. But then again, you preserve all the structure. So maybe it's worth it. So that's for the spatial discretization, but then um, we also need to discretize these equations in, in time. And uh, this is a non-trivial task, because if you use standard method, like, I don't know, the, some standard explicit running couple methods or something like that, um, it's not going to preserve all this nice Lee Poisson structure that we have in the equations. But fortunately, there is a big field of, of numerical analysts that have realize that if you want to discretize in time a Hamiltonian system, you need to use so-called symplectic methods. So there is this field of, of symplectic, for example, ryan kata methods. Uh, so our first uh, sort of approach was, okay, let's try to use these methods. But then, then we realized these methods are really developed for canonical Hamiltonian systems. We have now a non-canonical system. And if, 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 if you apply the symplectic Mankata methods to the non-canonical system, you destroy the Lipposson structure. So in fact, symplectic Mankata methods are not symplectic when you apply them to these kind of Hamiltonian systems. Uh, and then nor are they isospectral, which sort of goes hand in hand. So we needed to do something. So this was the first thing my student did. He developed uh, a new class of methods based somehow on, on the classical symplectic Friar-Kata methods, but, uh, but with some tweaks just to make sure that you conserve all these quantities. I don't want to go into detail here, but the, the, the main theorem is that we now have a class of methods that we can apply to these uh, isospectral flows. They preserve the Lipoisson structure uh, on any reductive B algebra. So SUN, for example, is a reductive B algebra. So it would work. So this is, these are the tools that we're using. Let's now discuss the results. So all the results I present uh, are on the sphere. But I sort of use uh, spherical coordinates to unfold the sphere. So the, so the upper edge here on this rectangle corresponds to the North Pole. And, and this uh, lower edge here is the, the South Pole. 
So these are now, I'm using the same initial conditions <coughs> as in the paper by Dritchell, Key, and Marston. Actually, this is, and they claim this is in generic initial conditions. Actually, I think this is an interesting question. And I think this is the audience exactly to sort of address that question. What do we mean with generic initial conditions? What the physicists do is, or at least what, what these physicists did, was just to take um, the spherical harmonic basis and then truncate it, let's say at 10 spherical harmonics, and you multiply each harmonic by uh, some random number between 0 and 1. This is what they consider generic, but I'll come to that later, maybe there's a more, a more systematic way. <laughs> anyway, this is the initial uh, configuration as it looked like. So uh, I think white means positive vorticity, uh, black means negative, and gray is sort of zero. Right? Uh, and, uh, and here you see the evolution. In this case, we use n equal 500 which sort of corresponds to n squared degrees of freedom, or n squared spherical harmonics. And you see that there's some mixing going on, uh, and you, you really see the inverse energy cascade uh, here, for example, which sort of tends to take smaller vortex formations and merge them into larger ones. But, and, and then you see here, now we're stuck with, with four of them, two. Two negative and two positive. Let's run this much, much faster. So now there's an initial sort of transient phase of mixing. <coughs> and then what happens? You see this beautiful pattern emerging with the four vortex blobs. These are not point vortices, right? They are not delta pulses, but they are vortex blobs interacting in some interesting manner. Again, what is the difference between the white and the black? So, the so, so they, they come in pairs. So, so the white are positive, okay. and the black are negative, and the background here, gray, is sort of on average mm -hmm. zero. Yes. Um, okay, so now, now, now we have sort of done what we wanted, because now we have strong, even stronger numerical evidence against MRS on this field. Because we're now using a method that preserves all the Casimir's and the Lee Poisson structure. But just looking at this, if, if you want to be a physicist, right? Sorry? If you look at this. If you look at this, let me show it again. And, and you know a little bit about MRS, you want to be a physicist. Because, I mean, just look, I mean, there must be a way to describe this, right? There must be some other mechanism behind this. And if you just look at this, it, it certainly looks like interaction between point vortices. So let's try to compare the dynamics we see here with the dynamics of finite dimensional point, vortex, uh, point vortices, four of them. So, so we tried to do this, so we extracted, uh, we wrote a little algorithm to, to track the, the center of mass for each of these uh, vortex blobs, to extract the motion. And then we extracted also their strengths, the relative strengths. Um, and we compared this with what you get with point vortex dynamics with the same sort of strengths. And we get very good correspondence. So here you see just one revolution. Uh, there, there is the, <coughs> maybe that's the positive, positive, negative, negative. Uh, and here is the, what we saw in our simulations. And this is what is traced out uh, by the the finite dimensional point vortex dynamics. So, so you even get sort of the nice shape here, correct? And if you run this for very, very long, uh, it doesn't change much. Right? And the nice thing is that, okay, we, we got these sort of blobs when we used n equal 501. That's a quite high resolution here. But in fact, we can capture this behavior with much lower resolution because we now have all these nice conservation properties. We don't need very high spatial resolution to capture this behavior. <coughs> so that means, of course, a small n means much cheaper calculations, so we can run the simulation much longer. So that's actually important that we are able to capture this even for, for a small value. <coughs> of 
Yes. I want just to understand the, the picture on the left for vortices. is what are you running on the left? So, so the, what is the dynamic? This is, this is the sphere, right? Yes, yes. Yes, in spherical coordinates. Uh, I have four point vortices. Okay. Uh, let's say this is the initial, con the initial condition here, 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 and here. Two of them are negative. Here is how negative they are. Minus 0 0.54, minus 0 0.42. Two are positive, plus 0 0.9, plus 1. And you are running the point vortex. And I'm running the point vortex dynamics, and this is just with four, with four of them. With four, yes, with four. Okay. Uh -huh. And here you see the trajectories. This is basically what corresponds to just one of these revolutions. And if you run it for very, very long, this is how it looks like. So I will come back to this. This certainly looks quasi periodic. Right? And the blob motion also looks sort of on large scale quasi periodic. Um, okay, so so this is nice because now, I mean, maybe that's what happens. Somehow, you know, it's really low dimensional point vortex dynamics that describes what happens in the limit. So, um, what do we mean with this? Well, let's try with some other initial conditions. And let's think more carefully about what do we mean with generic initial conditions. So our interpretation is this. Okay, so let's look at the, regular, the, the theory for the Euler equations on, on this figure. Um, what is the sort of largest space where you have global existence? And then you try to take a Hil the, the largest Hilbert space that you can fit inside that, that space, right? Um, and then we know that we can we can draw samples from Gaussian random fields on, on, on a on a infinite dimensional Hilbert space. So that's how we sort of approach this, and that means that we need to to find uh, Gaussian random fields uh, on H one, H one one fields. So we do that, and then it looks something like this. See, it's not it's not white noise, right? It's it's correlated, uh, and then we run the simulation again with n equal 501. So one thing I forgot to point out was that in the initial, uh, the initial conditions we used in the previous simulation, the, the total angular momentum uh, was zero. And that was sort of set by, the, by these authors, uh, the Richard um, Key and Marston, and the reason for that, they said, okay, we don't want to start with some configuration which already has sort of large scale motion. So let's set, let's set the momentum to zero. And, then, and I can say something, because you always do this on the torus. You set momentum to zero. Because on the torus, uh, the momentum corresponds to sort of linear motion, and it doesn't affect the dynamics. But on the sphere, angular momentum very much affects the dynamics. And I'll come back to that. So in, in fact, by setting the, the initial conditions with zero momentum, they excluded a large part of the phase space, or, or of the dynamics. So here is another simulation, uh, just generating a random field. We didn't say anything about momentum being zero. What do we get? Some initial mixing, again, looks a bit rougher because we started with more rougher initial conditions. But again, we get these vortex blobs. How many are there? Do we have here? Last time we had four. Can you count? Three. Three. <laughs> yes, not four. Three. Aha. What's going on here? Are you sure your simulation is high? <laughs> <laughs> what? Let's see. So, so can we explain this? Why do we get sometimes four, sometimes three? And in fact, it's true. We run many of these simulations. We sometimes get four. We sometimes get three. So, is there a theory behind this? That's what we sort of are aiming for now, because it's a low-hanging fruit. We want to be physicists, remember? So, so the the main observation is that when we do these simulations, the large-scale motion does not settle as MRS predicts. Instead it seems to settle on some quasi-periodic motion. And it seems to be uh, described well 
by point vortex dynamics. <coughs> so let's uh, make some assumptions for, for a new theory replacing MRS. So um, we have, of, of course, we have to accept the inverse energy cascade. And what it's doing is taking small vortex formations and merging them into larger ones. So when, when you have two sort of small vortex formations and they get close enough to each other and they have the same sign, they tend to merge. And then we also assume that if you have well-separated blobs, then as long as they are well-separated, so they don't merge, they are sort of well-described or approximately described by point vortex dynamics. Let's make this assumption. And then the other thing is, if the dynamics is not integrable, the, I'm talking about the, the, these blob dynamics, the point vortex dynamics, not integrable, chaotic, meaning that you explore all of phase space, right? Then sooner or later, two of these blobs with the same similar sign will get close enough to merge, right? So, you know, you have some merging here into larger and larger vortices, and this continues until you reach a state where the dynamics is integrable. What does integrable mean? It means that uh, the, the, there are many ways to define it, uh, uh, but the easiest way to understand it is that there is a change of coordinates into so-called action angle variables, where the motion is quasi parabolic So, uh, here is our mechanism. The blobs continue to merge until they reach a state where the dynamics is integrable. And then they are sort of prevented from merging further, because now they cannot reach each other. The quasi periodicity prevents further mixing. Okay. So, to, to sort of test this theory, we need to know about the integrability of point vortex dynamics. So, what is known? So, point vortex dynamics has really developed into sort of two fields. In one field, you take the number of vortices, point vortices, to go to infinity, so large n. That's what I talked about earlier, and what Tunsager wanted to do. But then, it's also interesting from a sort of mathematical point of view to study what happens for, for just a few point vortices. Uh, and this has been done for a long, long time, and there is a survey article by, uh, from 2007 where it said that this field of point vortex dynamics has sort of have diverged a bit from its original motivations in fluid mechanics and is now a classical mathematics playground. And it has many strands of classical mathematical physics come together. So this is the sort of field that people like to do because it's interesting to study integral systems and try to relate them to each other and, 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 and to other systems and so on. So it's known since long that if you take K uh, point vortex dynamics on the sphere with K uh, point vortices, this is integrable if K is less than or equal to 3. So this, this I knew already before I started working on this. Uh, and that sort of explains why we get the 3. But what about the 4? Remember, when I did these long time simulations with the 4 point vortices, it looks like it's quasi, quasi periodic. So I was thinking, okay, maybe for the zero momentum case, actually the dynamics is integrable. And we were able to prove this, uh, but then we found that it was already known. <coughs> so in fact, if you take a, point, a four point vortex uh, setup on the sphere, this is non integrable in general, <coughs> but if you take the momentum to be zero, then it's integrable. So then the motion is possible. So now we have our predictions. If the momentum is small enough, we expect four, point vort uh, four vortex blobs. Uh, if the momentum is large, so we we'll summarize it here, if the momentum is small, we expect uh, four blobs with non-steady non interaction. Um, if it's uh, intermediate, we expect three non-steady vortex blobs. So here you see an example of four, here you see an example of three. And then you can also say, what about if the momentum is initially very large? That means you, from the start you already have two large blobs 
then we expect those blobs to remain and perhaps another small one uh, along. So that's a little bit what you see here as well. So this is our, our predictions and we've done many simulations and it seems to, 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 to work uh, very well. But these are just numerical simulations, of course. So, so what is next? Well, I mean, we have to prove things. We're, in the end, we wanted to be physicists, right? But it's also quite nice to be a mathematician. So, so maybe we, so we need to prove things. And the absolute first thing to do uh, is, of course, to show that this quantized version of the Euler equations actually converges to the Euler equations uh, as n grows. And this has been done uh, already on the torus. Uh, so what we're working with right now is to, to sort of see if we can do this also for, for the sphere. It, it's, it's harder than we thought, uh, but I, I think it, it uh, should be, we should be, be there soon. One other thing uh, that needs to be investigated is the relation between vortex blob dynamics and point vortex dynamics. Uh, and the good thing is that many of these questions have already been, at least to some degree, um, looked at by other people. So, so we're trying to look into that also, what is known about this relation between blob dynamics and, and uh, point vortex dynamics. And then if you extend these ideas a little bit, you can think, okay, maybe these quasi-periodic uh, Euler solutions can really be interpreted as sort of perturbations, now infinite dimensional perturbations, of some integrable PDs. So and this calls out for, for infinite dimensional KM field. I forgot to say that momentum is zero, then point vortex dynamics is integrable. That means also if the momentum is very small, it's sort of near integrable in the KM sense. So because you have this KM theory that tells you that if you take an integrable system and perturb it a little bit in a Hamiltonian way, then it remains almost integrable, as long as the perturbation is small enough. Uh, the quantization also gives a sort of I think an interesting approach to, to study weak diffeomorphism. So diffeomorphism normally is somewhere in the strong case, but it's been an open question for long to try to sort of which is the natural way to generalize the mean in a weak uh, sense. Of course, the, this is on a, what we consider now is the non-rotating case. So a very interesting case is what, what happens when you add Coriolis parameters to the equations. That doesn't change the Casimir's, it just changes the Hamiltonian a bit. It's still the Le Poisson system in the same sense, but you're changing a little bit the Hamiltonian. So we can still use the same method, so this is something interesting to, to look into as well. There are many other questions as well uh, related to this that uh, I hope to, to address. Okay, that's really all I wanted to say. Thank you. So the, the synthetic uh, methods you had, uh, so you said that they are for uh, reductively algebra, so what, the, where do you need the relativity then? Uh, you basically need that uh, if you take the algebra uh, and apply the, uh, <coughs> the, the complex conjugates, then you map back into the algebra. Mm -hmm. And then you know that reductive algebra can always be represented like that. So that, that's Maybe I should have said that instead, but it sounds cooler to say without the other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Um, do you have, a, do you have a, an understanding of what's the distribution of vorticity inside the blobs? Uh, no. I forgot to write that as so a dot, 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 right? That's a very interesting... Uh, uh, there, 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 there have been some work on that recently by physicists. Um, on, on also on the on the torus and on the uh, in fact on the on the square I think, and what they realized is that uh, at least by using this uh, sine bracket uh, method on the torus, they could, they could see that just changing the uh, the geometry a little bit uh, affects the, the, the affects the, the, the formation of the blobs uh, a lot. Change the geometry of what? Sorry. Changing geometry of what? Yeah, for example, if you take if you start on the square uh, with periodic boundary conditions in both directions, yeah. so that's the torus, and then you just make it a, a, a rectangle, a little bit of a rectangle, 
that, that can completely change the, the behavior of how the blobs look like. Uh, so, so that's a, 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 an interesting question. I know other people are interested in it, but we haven't addressed that yet. So, so is it? Sorry. No, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Can, uh, in the simulation about, again, uh, go back to the vortex, uh, did you, the simulation you did, was it really, uh, um, was it really a point vortex or was it the blob that you were simulating? Point vortex. So, really point vortex? Yes. And you are able to simulate it? Yeah, of course. It's, uh, yes, it's just, this but is... But you take the, the equation for the, the ODE and... Yes, just the ODE. It's a Hamiltonian, it's a, it, this is in fact a canonical Hamiltonian system. So there are plenty of methods that okay. preserve this invective structure for such a... Such so you are really similar to the methods? Yes, yes. So I'm comparing, I'm really comparing with point vortex elements. So, so again, what is the difference between uh, this and Jordan between torus and sphere? Well, what, what, <laughs> uh, different, I mean, from your point of view. <laughs> I mean, from my point of view, it's the difference is the curvature, right? I mean, you know, <laughs> what, 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 no, no, I'm, I'm saying it's not a, about this behavior of... of uh, for the Euler equations. Uh, okay, okay, so now I understand. <coughs> okay, so for the Euler equations, uh, you could you could ask, Okay, so I have now a theory that describes what happens. Let's try to apply the same theory on the torus. And in, uh, because on the torus, it, it sort of the numerical simulations uh, seem to support the MRS theory. Mm -hmm. right? uh, so, and it seems to work as well, because on the torus, the, the maximum number of point vortices you can have that the dynamics is, is still integrable is two. So you expect only two. <coughs> Uh, vortex blobs using this theory. And that's exactly what you get. And then it turns out that the, the dynamics then is trivial. It's just the steady state. Except for the, the linear motion corresponding to the momentum. So, so from the point of view of Euler equations, uh, long time behavior of Euler equations, I would say uh, the difference between the sphere and the torus is that point for the, the, the limits for when you get integrability in point vortex dynamics are different. And therefore you get different behavior. Right. Sorry. Maybe yes, that's related to that, so because I know that, for example, on the plane you can have the, the initial configuration of three vortices which collapse. Right. That's probably what you cannot have on the sphere, or you cannot have that on the sphere now because no. it's integrable. So, so it will uh, will not it will not. Uh, yeah, it's cross periodic so it, it sort of blocks 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 further mixing. Yes. Can you prove some kind of similar results when you go into the SQD equation? So if you don't put the Laplacian, but you put some kind of fractional Laplacian? I, I don't know. I mean, so first of all, uh, you say proof. We haven't proved all Okay, similar. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, so you're, you're asking to simulate the... Vortex. Yes. Point. So you want to replace the, the Laplacian by the square root of the Laplacian, yeah. right? Uh, this is a very interesting question. Um, the, 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 it really boils down to if we can adapt this magic formula by a hot yes. to, to, to the square root. And it, it, I think it has to do, I've been thinking about this a little bit, I think it has to do with this factorization that we're using. So if you can factorize this into two symmetric op uh, operations, right, two operators, then basically you, 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 can, you can do it. Yes. But, but yeah, that's another point on the list. Yeah. Yes, I'm aware of uh, results in this direction, and by what everybody probably you know this name because it's really working on point vortex. Yes, yes. At a theoretical level, but I think he does also numerical simulation, and he has worked with SQG. Yeah. Okay. No, no, that's, that's interesting. There's a huge literature here, and, and the, for us, this is really has been going on for maybe two years or something. So I still have a lot to learn. Other questions? Then let's thank the speaker.